Okay, so our second our second speaker is Boyan Kalash from TTH. Um, he finished his PhD, I think, three weeks ago with Sasang, who also gave, gave a talk recently. And he's um, he did a lot of work on um, data debugging and machine learning on dirty data. And um, his next uh, his next stop will be Harvard, where he's going to do a postdoc. And he's going to talk to us about um, a paper that he and some colleagues wrote uh, a couple of years ago um, called, I think, Data Science Through the Looking Glass, where they analyzed um, uh, a large amount of data science notebooks, I think both from GitHub, but also internally from Microsoft. Um, and I think they have a lot of really, really interesting insights, basically, about what software is used in the data science world and how machine learning pipelines look like. So with that, uh, yeah, I'm handing over to Boyan. Cool. <clears throat> so thanks for the intro, Sebastian. And uh, hi, guys. It's a pleasure to be with you virtually. Uh, if you can uh, allow me to or make me a co-host or allow me to share the screen just uh, so I can share the slides. Let's see. Yeah, that you works. should be able to now. Just a second. Does this work? Yes, it does. OK, <clears throat> awesome. Um, so yeah, uh, so um, Sebastian pretty much laid out the, 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 the initial words for, the, for what I was going to say anyway for what this project is about. So the original working title was Data Science with the Looking Glass and what we found there. So we analyzed a bunch of, um, we, it was about analysis of ML workflows and uh, kind of uh, potential insights we can draw in order to inform future uh, uh, of ML systems. And uh, it was <clears throat> originally started in 2019 during my internship at Microsoft. Uh, it had a bunch of um, unsuccessful attempts at being published. And then finally now it's gonna appear in the next uh, edition of Sigma record. Um, so that we're very happy about. Um, and um, yeah, with that, let me lay out first a bit or well, the motivation of why we even started to look at this problem. Um, so <clears throat> basically, as we all know, um, you know, there are certain problems that um, machine learning was able to solve in a much better way than any other method. Um, and those problems seem to be uh, pretty important. So therefore, we can envision that in the future, there will be a lot of um, computer software that will have uh, at least an ML component or a learned component uh, that is part of it. And already we have a pretty big and growing ecosystem of uh, various tools and systems that were developed for, um, for supporting the development of such ML components. But then the question is, uh, how do we make decisions of what, how do we design or what, what direction should these tools and systems take? Um, and so, so far, most of it was basically, um, you know, most of the inputs come from direct interaction with customers. Um, and there we kind of collect their feedback, listen to how, how they, you know, what they complain about, what they like. And uh, of course, this is pretty useful as a, as a you know, as, as a source of input. But um, as scientists, we know that, uh, you know, given the small scale of this and given the sort of direct interaction with users, this can be classified as sort of uh, anecdotal evidence. So then basically we ask the question of, okay, can we do better than this? Uh, are there maybe certain insights that could be drawn, that could inform the future directions of, of ML systems research, that could be only drawn from um, an, a large scale empirical analysis of ML workflows. So could we be more like, uh, you know, empirical about this? And that was kind of the, the, or, the sort of original thought of the project. So back in 2019 uh, at uh, the Gray Systems Lab, uh, to kind of Kind of give you what was the backstory of how this paper came to be. There was Potis, he was uh, working in GSL on uh, some tools that could crawl uh, notebooks from GitHub and then do static analysis on top of it. And then there was Yuan, and she was the resident data scientist just sitting there doing data science -y stuff. And one day they got together and then they were like, okay, why don't we uh, combine what you have and what I have and why don't we use your data science to analyze data science? 
And then their mind just blew. And uh, it also blew the mind of Carlo and Marcus. And they were like, okay, guys, let's do this. This is so amazing. And then I was there also uh, working with Matteo on uh, part of my internship was about analyzing pipelines from machine uh, um, ML.net, which is um, a framework that's built by Microsoft, looks like SK Learn, but for C Sharp and .NET platform, basically, um, with certain additional capabilities. And uh, basically, we were analyzing that, and we were like, okay, guys, I think we should join. And uh, then also we got some other people to join. We also got my advisor, who at the same time was incidentally also in MSR Asia, and also Wenta from MSR. And basically, that kind of got the project started. And then, given our you know initial attempt to uh, you know um, publish it was not uh, successful, then the next summer uh, there was another intern, Jordan, who contributed also work on. Uh, extracting like a DAG from code of uh, like Python code, for example. And uh, that also then uh, made us, uh, enabled us to analyze what we will call um, implicit pipelines, uh, which I'll talk about in a bit. And he was working with Brian and uh, Van Katesh um, on that topic. So basically this is kind of like uh, the background of it and what is the methodology? So we have around 50 million of Jupyter notebooks that were crawled over time. And um, we also have around 88 million raw uh, pipelines that were produced uh, uh, from uh, in ML.net. And also we analyzed uh, um, 900 or more releases of various libraries that are used in data science, predominantly ML libraries, but not, not just. And then we extracted all of this and did a bunch of crawling and processing, put that all in a database. And then basically we draw some figures and try to uh, get some insights from that. Um, <clears throat> and also on top of that, we try to draw something like a more a speculative statements, uh, which you will, which we call kind of wild actionable guesses or wags. Um, and both of these are in, sometimes you will see that they're kind of um, semi-obvious uh, or, you know, not that surprising. But for that, we argue that at least now we have some empirical evidence to back it up. So uh, you know, what we thought was true sometimes turns out to be true. Sometimes uh, there are some surprises as well. So in the rest of the talk, <clears throat> I kind of uh, split it up into four sections that are based just on theme. But the most of the remaining slides will just be kind of like a, a question that can be potentially interesting. Uh, and then uh, some figures that were drawn by analyzing our data, and then maybe some insights and some wags. And um, let's start from the landscape. Um, so the first question is, okay, how many, how many notebooks do we have and what's the breakdown? So for that, uh, let me just go through briefly what is the extraction process. So of course, we first uh, crawl and extract the main, main branch from Git. Uh, we remove some uh, mileform notebooks, so some basic data cleaning, basically. Um, remove some duplicates and then load all the code content into the database along with some metadata and then perform multiple passes of static analysis on each code cell that we encounter. And on the ML.NET side, uh, we basically got the data from telemetry of internal Microsoft users. So those are the users that didn't opt out of being uh, um, silently spied on. Um, and uh, we basically got around 88 um, million of those events uh, that were collected between 2015 and 2019. And it's mostly uh, contains large scale enterprise applications. So they, these two kind of workflows, uh, you know, they, they differ in the sense, or these two data sets, they differ in the sense that, you know, GitHub is more uh, broader, like, uh, you know, without any major priors, let's say, and ML.NET is more, more focused on enterprise. Um, so those are, that's the difference between the two data sets. So the number of notebooks we have is like, uh, you know, depends on the year. Uh, it starts from uh, 123 million and then all the way up to, um, uh, sorry, 1.23 uh, million and all the way up to almost 9 million. Um, well, after deduping, so around a third of them uh, is a duplicate, so we remove those. And in terms of sizes, uh, it was a considerable actually sort of time consuming, like in terms of compute time, um, uh, you know, building tools for, to analyze this was, uh, was uh, a struggle that, uh, that the team had to deal with. So the initial insight we can get from this is uh, that the space of these notebooks is growing. Um, roughly, they double in number every year. Uh, so uh, with this exponential growth, we can just expect more 
uh, sort of um, more popularity of, of Jupyter notebooks as a as a as, as a medium for for data science. Um, so how many code cells are there? Um, so when we extract the code cells from them, uh, we get um, also a growing number of those. Of course, once we uh, remove the ones that are not code and we dedupe them, then we get like roughly 40% of them are, are. So in 2020, there's around uh, you know 100 million uh, code cells that needed to be analyzed. And in terms of languages, um, unsurprisingly, Python is dominant and also growing. Um, well, I mean, I don't know if it will continue growing after after being you know more than ninety percent, but uh, who knows? Um, so the sort of actionable guess here is that Python is basically emerging as a de facto standard for data science. Um, so that's kind of becoming the reality that's consolidating, uh, and uh, that is hard to see how it will change in the future. <clears throat> so just brief example of some code. Um, that we will, I'll come back to this example later, uh, but uh, just what one code cell could look like. So what can we say about uh, the code structure? So we basically um, try to categorize notebooks based on whether it contains linear or completely linear code. What do I mean for this? Well, let's, say, let's take an example from GitHub 2019, and we have uh, some billions of AST nodes, and then we see we get some functions and we get some classes. So um, and we also analyze if the code, con if, the, if the AST contains while loops, if statements, uh, for loops. Um, and if it doesn't contain any loop or conditional structures, then we call it linear. Um, and if it doesn't even contain functions or classes, then we say it's completely linear. So we can see that roughly a third of the notebooks in total are completely, uh, sorry, are linear notebooks. And a quarter of them are completely linear, not, no even, not even functions and classes. But if we look at the code cells, it, the numbers go up. So um, the majority, a vast majority, 80% of the notebooks are linear, no, no for loops, uh, and, um, and uh, three quarters of them are roughly, <clears throat> are completely linear, so not even functions. So basically, mm, nesting is relatively rare, rare in, in terms of code cells specifically. Um, so it seems that static analysis of the code can lead us, uh, can take us a long way, um, at least uh, for a good portion of, of notebooks and code cells. So to move on to import analysis, so here we analyze basically all the import statements in Python and see what kind of conclusions and insights we can draw. Um, so first of all, what are the most frequently used libraries? So as you can see, um, not too many surprises there, um, except for the fact that NumPy is def definitely like uh, the winner here and 60% of notebooks uh, reference NumPy. And also very few libraries are extremely popular. So if we look at NumPy, Matplotlib, Pandas, um, it's almost half uh, most for most of them. So uh, at this point, we may even wanna include them in the standard library of Python or something uh, because they're like, they're, they almost come in the package where people use it all the time. Uh, but also there's like a bit of a long tail uh, on the other side. So there's a bunch of other libraries that are used, but not as frequently. So what system builders could um, draw from this is that um, they should definitely prioritize if you want to optimize, you know, build a tool that kind of uh, runs some optimizations on top of these libraries, uh, definitely take NumPy into account. And also then Matplotlib Matl 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 and Pandas, those are the right in there. Uh, but it's also a good idea to make um, um, whatever system you're building pluggable, because there is quite a bit of a tail end there. So, um, you know, those that's that's kind of the, the wag. Um, so what about deep learning libraries? If we zoom in there, um, we see also for today, not that surprising that uh, TensorFlow and Keras are um, the, the, mo the most popular. We also have Torch. Uh, but if we look at it, uh, actually, we can see the popularity of libraries changes in time. So um, most of like the ones that are popular now, they keep growing. Terano and Cafe are unfortunately seem, seem to be fading out. Um, <clears throat> and um, only about 20% of notebooks use deep learning. So even though we have you know, substantial uh, you know, importance in deep learning, um, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't account for everything. So what are kind of our actionable guesses? There is that, uh, first of all, there's, we can see that there's churn and 
um, new libraries could emerge in the future and dominate, like Theano, uh, uh, sorry, not Theano, Torch, PyTorch, like emerged uh, right, you know, considerably later than TensorFlow, but uh, ended up uh, on a trajectory to dominate. And today is a very popular library. Um, so we don't yet have a NumPy equivalent of deep learning yet. So that's a kind of a, a wag. Um, and uh, deep learning is not everything. So that's the, you know, 80% of it is not deep learning. So, um, you know, we can get considerable color, co uh, co coverage and solve a lot of people's problems without touching deep learning. <clears throat> um, now, we can look at the change in popularity between let's say 2017 and 2020, 2020. And there we look at um, what is the change in rank. So if we sort all of them, which one made the biggest progress in terms of ranking and also in terms of frequency. So there's some overlap there, but not all of them are sorted uh, the same way. So the first insight is that, uh, well, again, mostly usual culprits. Uh, PyTorch has the most uh, dramatic jump, especially in rank. Um, <clears throat> but this is followed by Keras, XGBoost, TensorFlow, um, we see an emergence of certain image and text processing libraries. So it's not that people didn't do images and text earlier, but we see certain libraries that start to kind of uh, become more prominent there. Um, also, it turns out that accessing the data directly from the database seems to be like there's a slight trend towards uh, having more of that. And also uh, more TQDM, which is a library that's uh, used for plotting um, progress bars. Uh, which indicates that either people are discovering that this library exists or there are more long running jobs um, in, that are executed from within Jupyter Notebook. So we also look at some correlations. Uh, so are there some libraries that are frequently used together or frequently used not, like never used together or less frequently? Um, we find some negative correlations, some positive correlations. So <clears throat> here I'm not going to go too much into details, but some of them are, you know, um, for example, um, you know, Matplotlib and NumPy always come together. Or another more interesting maybe um, insight is that um, um, since like Pandas is not so correlated with these deep learning libraries, so it means that um, people are less likely to um, use uh, tabular, to do deep learning on tabular data. Um, but in general, um, these numbers could be useful for, you know, whenever you're optimizing a system, you want to decide which libraries you want to optimize first. Um, you know, if you do it on NumPy, you should make sure that you're compatible with Matplotlib. And also, um, yeah, so, you know, it could be useful to know these correlations for that purpose. <clears throat> um, now, you can also look at coverage. So if we look at, uh, if we just focus on a subset of libraries, how many notebooks can we cover in total? So there's this coverage graph. Um, so the main insight is that uh, with only 10 libraries, we can already cover more than a third of the notebooks, which is pretty interesting. So, you know, it can get us started pretty quickly. And also with 100 libraries, we can cover two thirds. However, to go further then, uh, there's quite a large tail and the large tail also keeps growing as years pass. So having total coverage is of course, um, probably unlikely. Now we can move on to pipeline analysis. So <clears throat> when I say pipelines, um, uh, this is what we call an explicit pipeline uh, in sklearn. Uh, so those are basically defined using the sklearn API for defining pipelines. And they are just a, a sequence of operators. Uh, the first one of them are what we call transformers. They transform the data. And then in the end, there's, all, there's pretty much always a a model that's either a classifier or a regressor. Um, and uh, basically when we extract pipelines, we extract structures like this and then we analyze them. Um, on the ML.net side, um, the pipelines look uh, like this. I mean, this is like a visualization. Um, functions in a similar way, except that these are DAGs. So they are a bit more expressive than sklearn pipelines. Um, it's, yeah, it's slightly more, it gives you a bit more control over uh, where your operators get applied to which columns. Um, and the third one is what we, this is what we, you know, sort of Jordan's contribution there was uh, these implicit pipelines. So if we had just a code block, then um, this could be seen as a DAG of operators, of course, and uh, 
we also were able to analyze those, and that's what we refer to as a implicit pipelines. So there's explicit and implicit pipelines. So how many distinct pipeline operators did we encounter? Um, in terms of number of pipelines, um, if we compare implicit and explicit, we can see that uh, implicit ones, uh, there's pretty much an order of magnitude more implicit ones. Um, so that could like say that maybe like around 10% of um, notebooks or you know people, let's say, use um, the explicit sklearn um, API for pipelines, but most of the people prefer uh, to just, you know, run a bunch of uh, Python statements and then, uh, you know, do their data processing that way. And in terms of distinct operators, uh, so those are the elements of the pipeline, uh, we can see also that, uh, of course, given that there's more freedom, the implicit ones are just way, way more than uh, the explicit ones. So just mind here, this is like a log scale plot. And um, the main insight is, of course, that there's a growth, uh, but it follows the growth of number of notebooks. Um, and um, another insight is that uh, there are more distinct operators that provided than there are provided in sklearn, for example. Uh, so that means, you know, sklearn, for example, has um, around in the order of hundreds of uh, operators that are there. But <clears throat> um, here we see in the order of thousands or more uh, distinct operators. So that means that people are heavily using UDFs, um, or at least that's a considerable portion of the workload. In ML.NET, this is the same case. So ML.NET has also in the order of hundreds of uh, operators, but then we see tens of thousands of unique operators. So that means that uh, there's there's a considerable portion of them that use uh, UDFs as well. Um, so what is the size of these pipelines normally? For explicit pipelines, um, we can see that, um, first of all, so we, we plot basically on the x-axis what is the length and how many, this is like a histogram. Um, so we see that the histogram is like right skewed. So most pipelines are small. Uh, in particular, these explicit pipelines, actually most of them are like between one to four operators, um, which is pretty interesting. Uh, means that, you know, it's it lends itself to easier analysis. Um, sklearn are even shorter than ml.net um, and uh, probably due to the less expertise uh, of users, but they creep... Um, they get keep getting larger over the years, um, which could indicate that um, that people are getting more comfortable with the API and using it for more complex for building more complex pipelines. <clears throat> On the implicit pipeline size, we see that you know of course there's much much more of them, um, and uh, it's also right skewed. So most of them are short, but they're uh, they are considerably longer than the explicit ones. So these ones go up to 100 operators, um, and the complexity is larger in general. Um, so which are the operators that are more frequently used? So if we look at, try to zoom into particular operators, we first look at transformers and we look at it in sklearn and ml.net, which ones do we find? Um, we can, we will see that they're not exactly the same uh, sort of set of operators. Um, uh, so on sklearn side, we have standard scaler. So this is used normally to scale numerical data. Count vectorizer, TFDF transformer, those are mostly for text data. Um, we have polynomial features, which are, again, for numerical data, uh, for, you know, producing polynomial uh, features. On the ML.NET side, we have one-hot encoding, so it's a standard uh, sort of uh, encoding for categorical features. We have text featureizer, um, which is a kind of a one-stop shop operator for, um, you know, um, extracting text features. Um, there's also one for imputation of missing values. And um, there are a few other specific text operators that are also very prominent. So what we can see here is that text transformers are popular across the board, uh, both in SQLR and ML.NET. So, and um, GitHub notebooks seem to have more numerical data, which is indicated by, by the, the types of operators that are more, most frequently used. Uh, and also another one we can see is Microsoft users deal with more categorical and or incomplete data. <clears throat> So apart from the text data, which is across the board. So in terms of top learners or models, um, on SKLR, we see logistic regression, multinomial na naive bias. This is a support vector machine classifier, uh, linear regression, random forest classifier. On the ML.NET side, we have uh, fast tree, fast forest. Those are you know specific implementations of um, decision tree and uh, random forest. There's logistic regression. There's Poisson regression. 
which is um, you know uses used to model is for regression, but for modeling the Poisson distribution. Um, and there's the average perceptron, which is a neural network. Um, so we can see that um, the trees and logistic regression are popular across, across the board here. Um, most people do classification tasks, apparently. Uh, another thing we can draw from Microsoft users, maybe this holds for other enterprises as well, that they, are, they have a considerable number of workloads that probably predict counts, uh, which is what this Poisson model is mostly used for. So um, again, let's look at the coverage graphs. So if we focus only on a subset of operators, um, in terms of explicit pipelines, and also we can look at uh, implicit pipelines. Um, <clears throat> so if we cover, um, what we can notice is if we, if we cover 80% of pipelines in, uh, we can cover 80% of the pipelines with just 10 ML.NET operators, which means that, um, you know, for optimization, this lends itself to, to, um, to um, it makes it easy. Um, on the other hand, also, we can achieve the same with all 100 operators from SKLearn. Um, however, uh, yeah, we can say that implicit pipelines are much harder to cover uh, because the, the, it's more skewed on the other side. Um, and explicit pipelines are growing, again, like around two times per year. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the vast majority of pipelines is implicitly defined. So the wags there are that um, for explicit pipelines, the more usage we see there is that uh, they use for data transform feature transformations. Uh, and uh, implicit ones contain data pre-processing and visualization operators data loading, um, stuff like that. Uh, we can also prioritize um, optimization. So if it's possible to prioritize optimization, if we want to optimize and cover the majority of pipelines. So for the final section, I'm just gonna run through a sort of a analysis of libraries. Uh, so there we look at the code of libraries itself um, <clears throat> and see what can we kind of, what trends can we see? So the first one, uh, is sort of what is the frequency of new versions of libraries that get released? And we see sort of this graph. Um, so first of all, Matplotlib, NumPy, and Pandas are just being consistently updated. So these are very stable. You know, there's a lot of work going on there. Um, some libraries have plateaued, which kind of indicates that uh, the, the projects have died out. <clears throat> um, there are definitely libraries that have a steady increase, which means that they're alive and well. We can notice the rise of deep learning around 2016 and after that, because before that we didn't have um, like deep learning libraries that are alive today are um, not present there anymore. Um, so how about the files that are in the libraries? Uh, how does this number evolve? So we also track that uh, over time. And uh, one thing we can see is that um, all libraries had a period of, uh, of rapid increase in the number of files. So this is probably like, you know, like from a stage of prototype to production. So that had a huge spike, probably also in the test code. Um, all libraries had the uh, phases of source code removal. So that's also one thing we can draw from there. Um, and also one last thing, uh, what we looked at is how about the number of, um, of classes and functions that we found there. And there we look at uh, the number of classes and functions, both in the total repo, but then we remove the test uh, you know, the ones that are under test or or documentation. Uh, so we just look at the the, the actual um, library itself. Um, and what we can draw there is that, um, you know, most libraries, since there's a difference in, uh, in, in the numbers, um, that um, a lot of code comes, goes to testing, uh, which is, you know, likely considered, uh, you know, contribution to their success. <clears throat> so that pretty much concludes my rundown. Um, I don't know if I mentioned yet, but uh, yeah, so finally this paper is, is going to appear in Sigma. It has, you know, you can see it for all the other details. Uh, another thing was that internally I was also made aware that uh, um, that um, there were, it made an impact internally on Microsoft on certain decisions uh, for what to optimize in the Azure ML services, also to verify certain uh, sort of um, hypotheses that people thought were true or not true. Um, in uh, VS Code and Azure Data Studio um, and various other things. So it basically like uh, made an interesting impact in terms of um, kind of um, uh, 
um, decision making within within Microsoft. So with that, I like to thank you for your attention, and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions that I'm able to.